I have three brief passages to read to you this morning. The first one, from the first chapter of Colossians, verses 15 to 17, and then the third chapter of Colossians, 14 and 15. Would you listen for the word of God? He, that is to say Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into the one body, and be thankful. And from Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So Biden had his crack at, uh, you know, the state of our union, and, and the other side had their crack, so now I'm going to take my crack at it. But I'm not going to really talk about the, uh, the political things, you know, the economy, the border, things like that. No, I'd like to talk about the mental health, the emotional health and the spiritual health of our society, it seems to me it's most important. But like one of these speeches, of course, you have to bring in some statistics, right? 37% of people in our country describe themselves as lonely, and let's define that a little more clearly. They don't interact with anyone else once a week. Don't. Less than once a week, 37%. They're lonely, and when you're that lonely, you get to feeling like nobody understands me. You begin to ignore your health habits, become discouraged. It's an epidemic, and we've heard it. They're even trying to come up with positions in government to do something about loneliness. Not sure how that's going to work because it seems to me as though it's a spiritual crisis, not a political one. 19.1% could be diagnosed with a general anxiety disorder, 23.4% of women. General anxiety disorder, it's actually tough to deal with. There's a restlessness inside. It's like you can't quite settle down to be able to enjoy anything in life. Your muscles get really tense, so tense you feel like they'd almost serve as guitar strings or something. Your sleep goes bad and, and that just kind of goes around in a cycle. That many people, 17.8% are suffering from clinical depression. That's up from 10.4% about five years ago. And depression is debilitating. I've been depressed in my life. I've struggled with that. It's as though your, your eyes get below a horizon and you can't see anything that has any hope at all. And you're helpless in the midst of it. Some people get angry. They, they lash out. Other people lash out at their insides. One of the things they suffer from is ruminations. You probably, some of you know what I mean. Just some negative thing comes to mind and you keep staying with it and staying with it and staying with it and you can't get it out of your head. Try and distract yourself and you just can't get there. Depression. You know, 22% of our teenagers have seriously contemplated suicide. It's just extraordinary. And the thing is, these are all what I call social diseases, like ulcers. 
remember when you were a kid? I mean, most of us are around my age. You were a kid, and everybody's dad seemed to have an ulcer. I had two uncles who had an ulcer. My best friend's dad had an ulcer. My girlfriend in seventh grade's father had an ulcer. Everybody had an ulcer. It was a social disease then. I'm not sure exactly how we healed ourselves from it, but that was the fact. In ADHD, I'd rather not even use the last D. That means disorder. It's a set of symptoms that uh, make it difficult for some of our children to learn. It's the society that's disordered, and it creates this social disease. It makes it difficult for children to grow up with any kind of normalcy. It's hard. And the thing about all these social diseases, let me just sort of step out of the sermon for a moment, is they all can be treated. There are things that can be done to begin to alleviate some of the symptoms. So if I've just described you, and you haven't reached out and started the process of si finding some kind of treatment, please do. You don't want to be stuck where you are. There's no reason to be. I remember my cousin once told me when he was depressed that he should be depressed because things weren't going well in his life. They should be depressed. It's gotten to the point sometimes where the surefire way I can tell if somebody needs medication for depression is they tell me they don't. <laughs> it's not literally true, obviously, but that's sort of a impression I get. So it is a set of things that we can do something about, but really underlying all that, something is wrong. Something's just wrong in a society where this is what's going on. The statistics make it sort of abstract, but nobody here escapes it. We all know people who have struggled or are struggling in some of these ways. All of us, I would say, struggle to some degree, even if we're not in a place where we're diagnosable. We're still under the same societal pressures that work at our hearts, work on our minds, bring tension into our lives. Even the healthy suffer from some of these things. I'd say that this congregation is maybe a little healthier than the general public. I mean, after all, you all see a person once a week. You come here, <laughs> you know, so you don't fit that 30% of the lonely. And yet I hear it all the time here. I hear the discouragement. Usually it's self-reflective, it's self-critical when I hear it. You know, I'm lazy or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> That's a real sign of depression that you don't have a lot of get up and go to do anything. I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of it actually everywhere I go. It's not a particular surprise. I mean, I can go back to the political, which seems to permeate everything in our culture. We're worried about our ecological systems, and well, we should be. You all know there's that plastic garbage patch out in the Pacific Ocean. Did you know it's four times the size of Germany? They've discovered plastics in the water, microplastics in the water, and these create disease. They've discovered them in all the oceans, including the Arctic Ocean, everywhere you go. We've impacted our environment. It's just true, and when you impact the environment, the whole thing is one large organism. It's going to <coughs> implicate us as well. And nuclear war, I'd gotten used to forgetting about nuclear war. Uh, somehow, I, I think it's, it seems, for some, a little bit more imaginable than it used to. And that's dangerous. That's an existential crisis that we know is there. It niggles at the back of our mind. And then this business about the, the disparity between the rich and the poor. I read somewhere this week that the three richest people in the United States of America have more recesses 
than the entire bottom 50%. Something's wrong. Things are out of balance. People aren't respected. I'm not proposing any policy changes. What I'm suggesting is that these dynamics impact us and affect the mental and emotional and ultimately the spiritual health of our world. We all feel it, and then one time or another, we all seem to take in that anger. Because in the midst of all these problems, the things that are going on, there's always somebody around to tell you who to be angry at, who's to blame. I'm not going to do that today because there's a system that's to blame. It's all of us. All of us have that responsibility, even the healthy, even the ones who are sure they are right. Something is wrong. So what does the world have to offer us? As we look at creation and try and find some hope and direction, well, it seems like science in its quest for truth has arrived at a conclusion that there really is no hope because we live in a mechanical universe. It doesn't seem to have any purpose. It's all random. Of course, if it's random and purposeless, I can't for the life of me figure out why they care about truth. Shouldn't we be caring about happiness if it's all just random and purposeless? And the thing is, they also try and convince us that Things like hope and God and love and the values of goodness and truth and beauty, those are all just things that human beings have made up to make us feel better. They're not true. It's a basic assumption, and we take that in. It's hopeless. It's made up. So surely the church has something to offer. And now I might get a little angry. Because when I think of the dominant narrative that the church of Jesus Christ has to offer this world, I hear one word, sinner. You're a sinner. And you deserve to be judged. Okay, because of Jesus, maybe you'll get to heaven. But for now, you're just rotten. No hope for you, not going to be able to reach into the future and have your heart become pure. You're sinners. That's the narrative that I hear over and over again. Maybe there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sins that we do and the judgment that comes by, but you can bet the justice in the right hand of God is ready to slam down on us if we do something wrong. That's the narrative I hear from the church, and it's bullshit. It's antithetical to Christian faith, and yet it's there. So many people take it in and say, oh, I'm not good. God doesn't love me because of this. People recoil from, from God because, because they feel like they've fallen short. The whole point of the gospel is that God does not look at you as not worthy of God's love. God has washed you clean is the way the gospel works so that God looks at each one of our lives and says, I care for you, I love you, I want to draw you closer to me. There's nothing that you can do to remove God's love from you. That's just the way it is. So we have to stop telling that story. We didn't make it up either. In the Psalms and ever since, the heavens are telling about the glory of God. Paul in the first chapter of Romans suggests that we have no excuse for not recognizing God because the heavens tell the glory the heavens describe the God who loves lots of ways. Over these last few weeks, 
there's been a theme that has popped into my sermons that has to do with the nature of God's creative force, the unfolding of evolution at all levels. It's as though we are moving towards identity that is shared. There are individual things that are drawn to one another that then create a greater whole. There's an intimacy even in the pulling together of protons and neutrons in an atom. You have to think about intimacy a little differently than we would think about it between us. But it's a drawing together and a shared identity in that atom that happens. This operates at the atomic level, it operates at the molecular level, it operates at the cellular level, at multicellular organisms, and it operates in organizations. See, we, we become members of things. We're individuals. We remain individuals, and yet we have an organizational identity. It can be national, it can be local, it can also be a family. <coughs> Always the movement of the creative power of God is towards greater and greater intimacy. And Paul tells us it's love that draws all this together in perfect harmony. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. It's in the nature of God's creation that we are reaching towards greater moments of in intimacy in matter and in life and in mind. The same processes unfold before us. Evolution is the progress of deepening intimacy one to another. And any suggestion that there is something wrong with you that disallows you from taking part in that project in the love of God is bullshit. Completely out of bounds. It's wrong. I don't care what you've done, what you think you've done or think you've left undone. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of God. Do you recognize maybe that you're greedy? You grab hold of more than you should. There's no reason for you to dive away from God at that moment because the person that you've taken from might be ticked off, but God's going to be all right with that. God's going to continue to love you. Maybe you do feel lazy. You're criticizing yourself for not getting things done. Might not even be your fault, but even if it is. The nature of God is not to reject you, but instead to draw you closer in those moments. Amen. A Catholic priest wrote a book recently in which he pointed out in his at least informal uh, 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 study, 70% uh, of the sins that are confessed in the Roman Catholic confessional are sexual, men and women. Isn't that interesting? Sexual sins seem to be the most prevalent. So maybe you overuse porn. That is not going to have God rejecting you, moving you away from God. In fact, it would be counterproductive. If somebody's overusing porn, the thing isn't to say to you, you're a sinner. Right? Because that feels horrible, and then you want to do something that maybe, maybe makes you feel better. You see the problem? God's love is always drawing us closer, seeking to perfect us. There is nothing that you've done or left undone that changes the nature of God in that way. Amen. And that's the story we have to tell. I dream of the day that when I introduce myself as a preacher, nobody apologizes for having cussed earlier in the conversation. I mean, the underlying assumption is the God whose right hand is there to crash down. 
It's the story the church has told, and we need to untell it because it is not gospel. It is not biblical, and it is not true. That's the story. We need to tell the story of an evolution, of an ever-increasing intimacy and love. And we need to participate in it. Love can't be something that we just hold inside and maybe give to one person. The love we give is a love that, that God is looking to express through us. There's a wonderful song. I really like it. I'm going to see if I can sing it now, even without a note. Here I give my love to you. 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 I once sat in a room with 500 people where we sang that to one another. Looking around, walking around, 15 minutes or so. It changes the heart to feel love expressed from you and to you. It's what the gospel calls for. It's what the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is pulling you toward. And once we get that right, once those assumptions become a greater part of who we are, well, then we can proclaim the state of the nation as being spiritually healthy. Whatever burden weighs you down, whatever flaw, whatever trauma you've experienced or dream that's been left unfulfilled in your life, know this. You are an expression of the creative love and power of God. You cannot be separated from God's love. God seeks your perfection and not your destruction.